All right, last time I was here, um, I had somebody ask the question um, about taking a photograph and converting it to embroidery. There's a few ways that we can do this. Is, um, you know, for example, I've got this photograph here as well as I have another one opened up with a little more color. When taking a photograph, if you want it to look exactly like the photograph, that is going to take a lot of digitizing, very time consuming, um, a lot of different colors, because you have a lot of shading going on, um, especially like right here in the eye. And then right as the, the color of the skin fades off into the, uh, the black, you'll have um, you know, some shading effects that you'll have to do in here. So doing it that way, um, you know, it takes a lot of experience and as well as very time consuming, a lot of sew outs to make sure you've got your shading just right, the right density, um, the right number of stitches, the right colors. Um, the other way that you can do it, um, it's kind of a abstract, so to speak, is, you know, once you've got your image on screen and you have highlighted it, if we go to embroidery, tab, tab at the top, choose art to stitch, down at the bottom here, you have Im image to photo stitch. By selecting this, it'll then ask you to, almost like a fill section when you're outlining an area to be filled. So we want to do the whole, uh, the whole image here. So I will manually place my points uh, going around, of course, with the left mouse button. I do not want a curved. Let me change that to straight. And just place my points going around. Basically what I'm doing is um, setting up the perimeters for this image. And then once again, like a fill, it's going to close it off. Choose my start direction, my end point, and then how I want the stitches to be displayed. And I'm going to choose a left to right uh, for, this perp for this demo purpose. Press enter. It'll look at the image. And basically, it's almost like cross-stitching to get the effect of what the image is going to look like. Um, you can mess with uh, the hue of the black and the white to determine how much of the shading you want. Um, if, it's, if there's color in the design, you would mess with the color one. And it's just finding what works best for you and your particular image. So if I turn off the image, change my color from red to a black, click apply. It's now going to give a similarity to what it looks like using a cross stitching. Mm -hmm. So you see, you know, right about here, you can see it's got the facial, it's got the two different tones of the colors. We can see the eye, uh, the hair. You zoom in and you can see it's just really jagged lines, um, zigzag lines to create the effect that you're trying to get with this particular image. Um, up here, you can change the, the cross pattern. Um, if there is a color cross pattern, you can change it to color. Um, once again, like I said, you can adjust your colors to get the effect you're looking for of the design. Now you see, since this was a black and white image, this one isn't really working out too well for us. So I will change that back to uh, the black and white cross stitch. There's different styles of cross stitching you can use. Um, once you find the one you want, which I like the BW1, the black and white, is you've got your, your spacing or your cell heights. We'll change that, drop that to a 10. Drop that to a 10 so we can see the effect. And you see how really thick it is right here? Uh, let me change it from the blue back to the black. And I will take that number back up to 20. And that doesn't look too bad. You can really see a lot of the shading taking effect in the face. You can see where the lips are, the nostril. You can see the eyebrow. Uh, we can play with this. Put that back to 20. Takes it back to a lighter. Maybe make this one 15. 
that right there, I would be happy with. I would go ahead and take that, sew it out, um, put it in a frame, and frame it on a wall. Um, it, it's it's a lot different than um, anybody have any questions on that? On that one right there. All right, and up here, if we go to design two, which this one has color. This one's gonna be a little bit different. So what we'll do here is the same exact thing. You go up to embroidery. Oh, sorry, we have to select our image. We go to embroidery. We select the arc to stitch. We do image to, fo uh, to photo stitch. Once again, we will choose the perimeter of the design. I'll just choose the box. And it doesn't have to be the box. You can outline just her head. Um, you can outline just parts of the box. We'll go ahead and press enter. It'll look at it. Take what we have selected here and go ahead and create it. And as you can see, I mean, it did a pretty, a pretty good job. I always change it to um, a black color so we can get a, a better feel for what it looks like. And actually, there, that one right there, I would leave that as is. I mean, that looks really good. You can see the shading on the, on the right side of her face as it goes into the background, her lips, her teeth, uh, the eyes, the eyebrow. I mean, this one came out really good. Oops, put it right about there. Um, so, you know, like the question was asked, you know, taking a photograph of your granddaughter, your husband, your wife, your daughter, your family, um, you can get an effect by doing it as a cross stitch this way. Um, if you want to digitize it to where, we'll turn this off to where you've got, you know, in her face alone, you've got different shades of pink, um, tan, cream, uh, probably three or four shades of red in her lips. You've got her eyes. You've got shading up here in her eyelashes, her eyebrows, you know, underneath her chin. You've got a lot of different shadings. So this one particular design here, if you were to manually digitize it to get the full effect of the, of the skin tone and the bright red lips, you're probably talking, you'd probably use 15 to 20 different colors um, in this design so that you can get the full effect of an actual photograph. Uh, see, we have a question here. Uh, Pat's asking, how do you load a design you have purchased as a DST into the software? All right, Pat, um, I'll answer that just one more. Just uh, give me a second. I want to make sure nobody has any questions about changing a, um, a photograph from a uh, photograph to a stitch, uh, like a cross stitch pattern. Um, and these two photographs that I have here, I actually just downloaded off Google this morning. I just searched for uh, photographs and went into um, uh, faces and grabbed these two faces and uh, brought them into the software. Naomi's asking, what about the three color version of the color pick? Are you talking about this one here? where you've got um, the tans, the reds, and then the blacks, uh, Naomi? Okay, all right. Let's go ahead and choose this one. And we will turn, let's select... I'm just going to go ahead and save that one in another page. I do like the look of that one. We'll turn our image back on. We'll select it. We'll go up to embroidery. Choose our art to stitch. Outline our design again. All right, we come up here and we will choose CMY. And as you see, by changing it to colors, 
We can now adjust it up here to find the right shade, but using that particular CMY1 doesn't work for us. So let's try CMYK1. We got more colors in the design. It's a little trickier with when you're using colors. Let me zoom down a little bit. Let's see if we can increase the top part. There we go. Now we're getting into the face there. Adjust it a little bit more. Oh, made a little bit too much. We lost a little bit of the shading. We'll drop it back a little bit. All right, if we got that, then we've got our colors over here. So what we'll do is we'll go into our color palette, and I know the yellow uh, looks like it took on the lips. So I want to change that one to red. Click Apply, OK. And see, it, it jumps through the whole thing. So when using the colors, you've got to come through here and actually modify on the shades to get your, your, your three color image to look the way you want it. When doing a black and white, as you can see on this one, it looks a lot different when choosing just a black and white color because there is no color. Because when you choose this, the, the color one, it actually looks at the complete design and you've got color, the CMYK color throughout the whole design to create that image. So doing a black and white this way works the best, but you can do color. It's just a little more complicated due to the fact that you do, whoops, is you've got the you can see the COMYK running throughout the whole design. But you can sit over here, like I said, and play with the three colors it took to create this logo. And, you know, maybe change this purple to a lighter purple until you can create an image that you're happy with. Um, Let's see what else here. Um, we got a couple of questions. Let me see. Uh, Naomi, would it look better if we use the color families from the actual pick? By doing it that way, it would probably come out to the same effect, uh, Naomi. You definitely want to digitize that manually, and that is where you would do a lot of shading with different colors and uh, using loose density. What I mean by that, instead of using like a density of 5.25 or a 6, is you're actually using a density of like a 3 or a 4 so that um, it's really loose, hardly any underlay, because you don't want to see stitches going in opposite direction while you're filling it, and then you're going to overlay three shades of a brown to get that particular color of that face or of the person. Uh, see, Rose Ellen, see, um, how do you merge interlocking letters for initials from a true type font and purchase font that is a DST format? All right, we'll go ahead and jump into Pat's question first. Um, which will lead into your question, Rose. I'll go ahead and open up a new screen. And Pat wants to know, uh, just to refresh the question, is how do you load a design that you have purchased as a DST from Dakota, Great Notions, or off our Panastock CD into the software? Um, several ways you can do it. You can come over here to Designs, choose where the design is located, select it, drag it onto your screen, you can actually come up to File, choose Open, and in here you'll choose Open and Embroidery Design, uh, Pat. This is where you'll open up the DST files, CND files, Baradin files, um, you know, home sewing machine formats like PES. Um, the, one of the top Open Design document will only open the Liberty's DSG file. That's its own condensed format. So anything design that you get from somewhere else, you will choose open and embroidery design. And that how you will be able to, um, let me place my USB stick in the drive. I will see if I have any designs on there. Uh, let me close that window down here. And close this window down here. And I will open my embroidery design file. And you will go ahead and choose, you know, where you've got the design saved uh, from where you've downloaded it. And I've got mine on Trade Show. And just for example, I'll bring up, um, let's say Nashville. We'll go Nashville. 
and we will choose, say, um, classic guitar. Opens my design up. Let me turn off the points. And of course, it's going to come in not in the exact colors that it should. But this, this design here is how you would get your DST designs in from somewhere else. And then you'd be able to, um, you want to do lettering or monogramming and ordering fonts. How do you set it up as a three-letter monogram? All right, so let's say you've got Nashville sitting up here and you want to add text to the top of it. Once you've got your design up on screen, you simply just go to your embroidery tab, choose your lettering. You've got your true type fonts which come on your computer or you've got your digitized. We'll uh, select digitized, Arial. We'll type in um, a name. We'll say Blake Shelton. And press enter. It's going to bring it up on our screen. We will then position it where we want. Maybe come over to the left side. Change the color of the design. And then there you bring your text into that particular object. To arc it, same thing. Have it selected. Right up here in the top where it says arrange, you would select this and choose upper arc. Then down the bottom, when you get to an uh, a, a arrow pointing up and down, left click, drag it up. The node on the side allows you to select it and squish it back together or stretch it out depending on the look you're, you're going for. And that's how you would bring in stock text to a uh, DST design that you've gotten somewhere else. Monogramming, uh, Pat, the same exact thing is choose up here monogram. You've got roughly, I think, 19 or 20 different formats that you can choose uh, for monogramming. All the other ones that are locked, including when you're choosing your stock lettering, the lettering or the fonts that have the locks on them, you would actually purchase those directly from Sierra. So uh, if your computer is hooked up to the internet, you would simply click on the lock, t uh, the font that you want or the monogram. It would take you to their website, and then in there you'd be able to find packages or the pricing for those particular fonts. We're going to go ahead and choose uh, MG3007. We'll go ahead and type in our, our characters, which is our first initial, last initial, and then your middle initial. Press enter. And then there we have your monogramming. And when it brings in the monogramming, it is pretty much good to go. Um, you know, you, you could change the size of it. You can uh, do what you need to do to it to make it fit your particular um, logo. And just because it brings it in in green and maroon doesn't mean you have to sew it in those colors. You might sew it in a tan and black. Um, but this is just for a visual preference right here. All right, I hope that answered your question, Pat. Um, let me see here. You said, uh, can you download fonts from someone else and add to my font selection on the software? Those, um, if you download fonts from other places, Pat, those would be um, DST files. So you would have to come over to Designs and um, left-click, drag, left-click, drag, left-click, drag to actually create your name because each letter would be an individual design. So you would have to click and drag onto your screen and then place the letters together to create the word or the phrase you're going for. Um, the actual fonts that come into lettering, known as a keyboard lettering font, would have to be purchased from Sierra to be able to be incorporated into the software. Uh, but designs that we have, designs are um, fonts that are on the uh, Panastock CD that you receive, Dakota Collectibles, all those, each letter is its own individual design, so you would have to click and drag and then place them and, and do your spacing manually onto the screen to create the effect. You're welcome, Pat. Uh, let's see, Rose. Uh, let's see, here, refresh your question. How do you merge interlocking letters for initials from a true type font and a purchased font that is in a DST format, interlocking Vine font? Um, the same way, the way I just explained to Pat Rose is, you know, if you've got a font, which I don't have the Panastock CD on here, but you would go to, uh, easiest way is you would go to designs and, um, for example, uh, let's open up another screen so we get a fresh slate, is you'd go to designs and you would find where you have um, 
those designs located. For example, um, don't have anything in small fonts except for there, my DST designs. For example, we come in here like this, <clears throat> and if these was like an A and a B, and you wanted to, um, those are spangles. Let me find my designs, right? Anything in advance? We'll use this. For example, let's say you've got, this is a letter A, this is a letter B, and Cheers is a, is a letter C, and you want to merge them together on your screen. So first you'd have to do is left click on the letter A, click and drag to your screen. Let me get this out of the way on my screen. We would click OK. There's your letter A. We'd go back to designs, choose your next letter, which is the next initial, put that on screen, go back to designs and get your third letter, and you would keep doing this so forth, so forth, so forth until you created your design or your name that you're trying to accomplish and then you'd manually go here and place these together. So if it's a Vine font that, for example, is on our Panastock CD, you would bring in all the letters that you want to create your name. For example, if you're creating the word Cheers, you would bring in all the characters and then you would have to manually place them, overlapping them, so that um, you know, so that it looks like the, the, the vines intertwine together. Um, so that's how you would do, uh, like say, for example, the vine font off the Panastock CD. Um, how do you get the, let's see. All right, Tina wants to ask, is how can we resequence a DST file for, say, a hat? That one's a little trickier. Um, what you want to do is up here in the, uh, your object manager, which is on the far right of your screen, when you open that, it's going to give you a breakdown of the sewing sequence. So for example, I will go ahead and leave just the word Coldesi up on screen. You want to resequence this, this uh, sew-out sequence. Here are the stitch packs it took to create that word Coldesi with the CD logo on it. At any time, you could left click, for example, if you wanted to sew the cold Desi first and then do the, the logo on the left. As you can see, it does the left square, the right square, the bottom right, the bottom left, the C and the D, the border, and then comes across and does the text. So you want that to sew first is you highlight that text, left click with your mouse button, make sure you bring your mouse over to the left here, because if you notice, if you're over to the right, you don't have the line. So make sure it comes to the left, left click, drag it up to the location you want to place it at, which is in the first slot, let go, that will now sew first, and then jump over and do the CD. The object is if you want it to sew the COL, then some over here, then back over here, then back over here, it's best to have that uh, digitized that way, because the one color, oops, because this color here is all one complete object. If you notice, when I click on the stitch pack, it grabs the complete uh, Coldesi. Now, another thing that we can do is you can see we're connected by this stitch here. So we want to break the coal up and have Desi all by itself. So on the left-hand side, you want to grab your edit stitches, which is the little tool pointing to the red stitch pattern. Left click on any stitch in that particular part of the design. If you notice, it puts a, a an arrow pointing to a little square. On your keyboard, you're going to use the left or right arrow keys, and you can actually traverse through each individual stitch in this design. What we are looking for is the very last stitch in that word, in that letter L, before it jumps over to the D. And if you notice, it is right there. So now we jumped over to the D. You want to back up the stitch before it jumps over. You want to come up to the top where it says insert, Select that, and you want to insert a trim. By inserting a trim, it takes that stitch away. Now on the right side, if you notice, you have two packs. You've got the COL, and you've got the DESI. So you are able to break up that particular uh, DST design, so now we have two sections. So yes, you can choose this. Whoops, let me grab my select arrow tool. We can now select the COL, 
have that sewn first. Maybe take this, maybe drop it a little bit farther down on the sew out sequence so that what we've got now is it'll sew the COL, jump back to the left and sew the four squares, then jump back to the right, sew the DESI, jump back to the left and finish the design out. So if you've got a DST design that you want to break up, uh, Tina, is zoom into the area, grab your edit stitch tool, click on any one of the stitches. As you see, with the right arrow key on your keyboard, you can traverse through, left arrow traverses backwards, until you get to the last stitch in that particular design. For example, the COL. We can do the same thing. Find the last stitch before it uh, jumps over to the O. Let me actually find the last stitch here, make it a lot easier. So we have to traverse through the whole C. Find the last stitch, which is right there. So we back up. We back up to here. You go up to the top, choose insert and insert trim. So now we have the C and then the OL is by itself. So you can go through your text, any particular stock design, and actually break it up yourself. Is that, is that clear enough, Tina? Does that make sense? Oh, it is. Okay, I just saw it. There you go. You're welcome, Tina. Uh, okay, Naomi wants to know, how do you get the detailed printout to bring to the machine that talks about the color order and all the related info? That's a good question. Because normally what you would do is you'd have to just look on screen, Naomi, and here's your color sew out sequence here, as well as at the bottom of your screen right here. Shows you what color sew first, second, third. But if you have an employee or you want to take a hard copy, because what I tell customers is once you do a design and it's finished and you're ready to sew in the customer's location, always print out a hard copy to put in a binder with the last good sew out you did. So when customers come to your shop and, you know, they're always asking, you know, well, you know, can you do these shirts for me? I need my logo on the left chest. You know, have you done left chest logos before? Can you do left chest logo? They can look through your portfolio and see the designs that you've done actually stitched out. Kind of like when, uh, you know, people walk into a tattoo parlor and all their tattoos are on the wall of the artwork that they can do on your body. You're doing the same thing. You're showing a sew out of what you can do. That's more pleasing to the eye than just telling somebody, um, yes, I can sew on a left chest. Same thing when you go to a car dealership and you're like, well, does this car have navigation? Yes, it has nav navigation, but you'd rather see the navigation on how it works compared to just someone telling you about it. So what we would want to do here, uh, Naomi, is once you're done with the design, is we simply go up to File, and we choose Print. When choosing Print, you want to choose Print Formats for Embroidery Designs. And in here, it's going to bring up your list. On the top left, you want to choose basic information and change it to color sequence. Then on the right-hand side, I'll do a print preview so we can see it a little bit bigger, is it's got a breakdown of the colors you, you used, how many stitches each color had, and then down below, a printout of what's going to sew first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, all the way down the line so that you can print this out and have the exact colors you chose over here so that if you come back to it next year with the same design, but have to change it from 2016 to 2017, you can now see the printout, and it makes it a lot easier. All right, Roselle, whoops, let me close out of this real quick. Where, oh, there's the X. And let's see what's going on over here. All right, we got, uh, see, Rose wants to ask, regarding the merging of the font, how would you weld the three initials to take out the overlapping issues, as in the welding in vinyl designs. <clears throat> All right, let me see. Um, Rose, that would actually, to show you that would actually be a lot easier if we did a go to meeting um, on your computer. Um, then we could physically do it on your screen as you could watch that way. Um, you know, it's a little more uh, technical, and plus I would have to get the Panastock CD with, um, you know, the Vine font, which I do not have on this computer. I have on my work computer that we could do the go to meeting. We could do it there. Um, I'll just make a note here that you would like to see that, and we can um, go ahead and do that on a go to meeting to uh, show you a little bit easier on how to do that. 
Um, Naomi C., why is it called Stitch Pack rather than Path or Area? Um, Naomi, whenever you open up a stock design or a DST file, they're stitch packs because it's, it's a group of stitches. For example, like the Coldesi was one color, it was one group, so it's considered a stitch pack. Considering when you digitize something, you're actually digitizing each section, so it looks at it as a path, how you digitized it, a column fill, or a running stitch. So it breaks it up that way when you digitize it. So stock designs are known as stitch packs. Um, custom work that you do in the software are known as the stitch type that you choose. Uh, Pat wants to know, can he resize purchase DST designs? Yes, you can, Pat. For example, uh, let's go ahead and just take this design here. Whoops, let me close my screen so I can see my object manager. Is we will go ahead and select the stitch pack or the word Coldesi. And right now we've got 78 11 stitches. If we re-shrink this because it is a DST design, we still have 78 11. So what you want to do is, we don't want to save that one. Let's bring that one back in to start from scratch since I've modified it so much. Uh, there it is. Left click, once you have it up on your screen, up in here, um, for example, the, let me find the Coldesi right here. When you highlight this section, right now it's got 77, 88 stitches total. We come up to processing. Up in here will allow you to change your density. For example, if I drop it to 50% of the actual, press OK, okay we can see we now have 68, uh, 83 stitches, and you can see how loose uh, it has made the stitches. So when you take a stock design and you shrink it down or size it up, you know, a little bit, you would then come up to the processing and adjust your density up here. And then go through each one and modify the density. Does that make sense, Pat? Is that clear enough? Just want to make sure before I move on to the next section. So whenever you bring a DST format in and you size it, you can select that, uh, that design, go up to the top in processing, and, uh, you know, change the density to either increase it or decrease it. Depends on if you increase or decrease the design. Uh, yes. Oh, did, uh, what I'm doing is I'm clicking over here on the, on the right-hand side in what is known as the object manager. Um, the object manager will open up the individual stitches or stitch packs, depends on if it's a DST design or something you digitized. And I'm just left clicking on a, uh, the section that I want to modify the stitch count. When you do that at the top, you'll see it says stitch editing. This allows you to give you the capability of resizing the design, doing a processing. Um, also, when we chose to break up the L and the D, the C and the O, was right up here in insert. So open up your object manager and it allows you to work with the design a lot easier by selecting the different stitch packs on the right hand side. Uh, Tina wants to know, does Stitch Era have an applique function or do you, uh, does she need to manually set it up? Uh, Tina, I will show you right now. We will go ahead and close this one down and we will uh, close the guitar down. And um, you're welcome, Rose. You're welcome, Naomi. Um, let's open it up here. Um, let's see. When digitizing, if you choose the area, uh, uniform area, on the drop-down menu, it's got an option here for area with applique. So we would left-click on this. You would go ahead and, you know, outline the area to be applique, like you normally would a fill section. We'll close it. Once again, you're going to choose your entry point and exit points as well. Press enter and there is your applique. 
So with an applique setting, what this is, it has a running stitch that runs around your object to show you where to place the fabric. You'll incorporate a stop on your embroidery machine. And then you lay the fabric down, and then it comes across with the zigzag pattern to actually tack the fabric down. And then what I would do is I would copy and paste, put it back on top, but change it from the applique mode to now I want to do a pattern mode. Or actually I want to do a zigzag because I don't want it filled. Right here. Like that. I will then take it here. Separate the border. Grab that fill area and delete it. And now you've got it. So what you've got is you choose the uniform area, area with applique. It will, you know, you outline your object like normal, choose your start, your end point. It will place a running stitch to show you where to lay the fabric. Then it will do a tack down stitch to tack the fabric down. And then <clears throat> what you would do is, let me delete the green, is you would select that. Okay, everybody, select it. Hit Control C, Control V, which is going to paste it. On your keyboard, use your arrow keys. And 99.9% .9 of the time, you just go up to, to uh, hit your arrow key up twice, one, two, and then to the left, one, two. It'll place it directly on top of the previous um, section that you copied. We will then go over here. We notice we have two areas. We've got the applique and applique. We want the second one. Choose below. Leave it as an applique. But you want to choose borderline. Select borderline, and right now there's no fill mode. I change it from that to a zigzag pattern. Once I do that, I come to the screen. I right-click. Choose separate border so it separates the fill area applique with my zigzag. I highlight my applique area, right click, delete that object. So now I have just the applique area that I need and then my satin border on top so I get a nice clean edge around my applique. You're welcome, Pat. Um, everybody understand that? Does anybody need me to go over it again? And like I said, this is being recorded, so we will send you this video, and uh, you'll have a hard copy of it so that you can pause it and play it. You're welcome, Tina. Uh, see, Naomi wants to ask. Um, she only worked with GGs before. Okay, cool, no problem. Another question here is, how do you send the applique to the plotter? Well, the applique is, you know, you actually have to have an image of what you're um, outlining, Naomi. Stitching, the stitching will only be allow you to send it to the embroidery machine. If you have an image on screen, for example, if we just bring the big savings up on screen, convert that to a vector so everything is individual. We have four colors. We vectorize it. Click OK. And then let me delete my stitch pattern here. All right, so we have your, your design on screen. This is when you go up to File, Save, and you would actually select Send Vector Graphic to a Cutter. If you notice it says Vector, it has to be a vector image. It can't just be a regular JPEG image, and it's not stitching. So if you've got stitches or a, uh, a regular JPEG that you've used to create your design, it will not allow you to send it to the plotter. It will be grayed out as the rest of these are. So you want to make sure you take your image, convert it to a vector. So if you notice, each individual section is separate. So when you send it to the plotter, it knows how to break it up. Right? Is that, is that clear? Is that, is that okay, uh, um, Naomi? If I'm going too fast on some, uh, some things, um, please feel free to stop me. I will, I will go over it. I'm, um, you know, I'm not opposed to doing that. I want to make sure that you guys understand and I can answer all your questions and um, better help you in understanding the software to better help your business grow. 
Um, is there any questions um, on stuff we have gone over or things that you've come across in the software that we can cover? Um, sure, Naomi. It's uh, up here in File. Choose Save. And then Export Appropriate Formats. You've got either uh, Export the Graphic File or you've got Send Vector Graphic to Cutter. So if you get hooked to a cutter, you can send it this way. If the cutter is hooked up to another computer, you would select Export Graphic File. If you have stitching and you're sending it to the embroidery machine, you would then choose Export Embroidery Design Files. Otherwise, you would choose Save As to save it as a DSG file so that you can then open it up later on in the software and modify it as if you just created it. All right, any questions so far? Everybody getting ready for July, uh, July 4th? Got any big designs that you're doing for customers? Uh, let's see, Pat wants to know, does every file that you are changing have to be saved as a G DSG? No, if, if, if you're, the only time you really want to save a DSG, Pat, is if, it's, is if you created it in the software. You know, so for example, if, if you digitize this design, it says big savings, and you added some stock lettering to it, um, we'll say, uh, you know, Winn-Dixie, which is a uh, South store, I guess, grocery, uh, grocery chain, or, you know, if you chose Kroger, which is a Northern store, um, you know, I'll show you an example of, you know, Upper Arc, um, you know, we change it here. I got the color of blue, you know, and you come in to where if you're doing something, for example, say bike week, and you've got it to where you're doing it for this year, so it's 2016, everything looks good. Customer comes back, says, Nesh, says, you know, I love the shirt you did for me. Um, I want to do them again. The design was great. Everybody loved the design, but I want it to say 2017. With a DSG file that you create, all you have to do is open that up, select the 2016, come up to your text file, back out the 6, put a 7, enter, and now you just modify that design, save it again, you've got the same design. If it's a DST file, you would have to delete the 2016, go back to your lettering, choose the same font, the same density. Um, if you chose pull compensation, the underlay you chose, type in 2016 and, you know, replace it. So it's a little more time consuming doing it that way rather than saving it as a DSG file, it simply is just clicking on it and you know changing it from whatever it says to something new. I can spell Publix, right? Now we got Publix, it's still an upper arc. We reshape it. So within a matter of minutes, you're able to you know, change it from Winn-Dixie to Publix, whether it's a week later or two years later. So the difference between the DSG and the DST is the DSG gives you the editing capabilities as if you're still creating it the same day. Um, if it's a stock design that you're bringing in or you got from off the internet, if you're not doing anything to it, just maybe adding stock text to it, <clears throat> then yeah, you could just save that as a DST format. No reason, re reason to save it as a DSG. Um, but anything you create or you digitize, um, I would save as a DSG file, and even when you go to your, 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 your folders, maybe create a folder and call it, you know, DSG files, and then one for DST files, so that you have them separated and easier to find. All right, he wants to know, um, do you then go into the design and click the stitches between the letters to make it look nicer? Yes, I would. Um, and what's, what Pat is asking now is, if you notice, between the letters, you see the stitches, well, if you send this to the embroidery machine, it's going to sew with a stitch between each letter, which means if it's far enough apart, you've got to come in, trim out the stitches, you know, a little time consuming. A lot easier stock designing is select the text. Up here in scissors, we would go ahead, see right now it says no, we want to trim between the letters. So I select letters, the stitch is now gone. So what happens is the machine sews the letter P, stops, trims, jumps over to U, stops, trims, jumps over to B, and so forth down the line. So it saves you from having to take scissors, trimming out that excess stitch afterwards, possibly cutting a shirt. 
or putting a hole in it because you're in a rush or what have you. Um, oh, um, right here, Pat. When you have the text up on screen, if it's not highlighted, always make sure you select your, uh, your object select or your select object, <clears throat> excuse me, on the left-hand side. If that is not selected, it will not allow you to select anything. So always when you're choosing stuff, just go over and just click on it. Make sure you have it selected, and then that allows you to left-click on the text allows you to left click on a particular part of the design um, to be able to modify it. So you just left click here. So always make sure that you left click on your select object on the left hand side or the shortcut key right there as you can see is F11. That puts you into the, uh, the selection mode and then you just left click on the area you want to modify. Um, real quick on the text, uh, I had a customer um, ask this during the week. She was trying to do a stare text of a design, um, simply go to your lettering. We'll type in Tampa, Florida. We'll press enter. When you bring your text up on screen, obviously it comes in as a default of straight across. If you choose the arrange up top, ch uh, select step text. When you select step text, you notice you now only have a line underneath it and to the right with only three nodes. The bottom right node, when you get that double arrow, left click on it, drag it down, you now have the stair text. But some of your letters are now touching. Grab the node in the middle, left click, drag it out a little bit to add your spacing. And there you have your step text. We'll add our trims. And there you have your, your step text lettering. Um, you know, and all these tools up here in the arrange, um, all the ones that are grayed down here, this shape will actually take your design, uh, for example, panoramic, and make it fit in that particular shape. So if you're trying to write on a banner or you're doing roofing, somebody's got a roofing uh, company and you're putting in, you know, um, Tom's Roofing, find the one that looks like a roof and have it uh, shaped towards the roof. Um, I always like the panoramic one because it just looks, I don't know, really cool to me. But if, you know, you're doing an elastic shape, it'll take it like you're writing on a banner. So, uh, you know, in either one of these nodes in here, I'm not sure if everybody knows, but you've got uh, arrows on the bottom and at the top um, of each lettering. So the one at the top, left click and drag it, it's going to size just that particular letter and not the whole word. The arrow down at the bottom middle allows you to move that letter left and right. And as you can see, since we're on a banner mode, it's actually taking the shape of that banner and it's flowing as it goes through, turning as it's supposed to. Everybody understand that part? Any questions on the lettering that we could go over? You're welcome, Pat. <clears throat> Excuse me. I hope everybody's learning today. Um, a lot of things we did cover. Um, you know, lettering is a big part of it. Um, auto digitizing photographs. Uh, if you want, like a cross stitch. Um, cool, Naomi. Thank you. You know, the cross stitch for the pattern, you could do it that way. Um, you know, when digitizing photographs, that is very time consuming. There, there's a, a design that was done uh, years ago, decades ago. I think it was in the, the late 90s. I want to say it was Great Notions or Dakota Collectibles did it. It might have been Floriani. They did the, the Elvis stamp, and it was a large jacket back stamp. Um, and you could search for it. Um, just search for, um, I think it's El Elvis stamp digitized or Elvis stamp embroidered and it, there was a lot of colors that went into that that photograph to make it look as close as possible you you know the one thing you do have to remember um, is you know you're working with stitching and instead of ink so you are doing it with ink you can get a lot closer a lot you know a photograph photograph you're working with stitching 
um, you can get as close as possible, but it's thread, and you know it, it takes a lot of shading to 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 get the the complexity of a person's face um, to make it look lifelike. So it's really time consuming. It can be done, uh, but it's time consuming and just takes a lot of patience. Um, is there any questions so far? Everybody doing okay? All right, I hope this has been uh, enlightening for everybody and um, educational. Oh, we got a question here. Thank you for the classes. Oh, okay. Thank you, Linda. I do appreciate that. Yeah, that scissors feature, the, 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 um, the insert the trims between sections on a DST is, is really helpful because you can open up a stock design and actually break up, you know, in the middle of a, a, of a filled color and have two separate parts. So it's a really cool tool. Definitely just open up a stock design and select it and make sure that when you do that, you do choose over here on the left-hand side your edit stitches tool, which is the arrow pointing to the red stitches. And just left-click on a, on a stitch in the design use your left or right arrow keys and traverse through the stitches individually until you find out, uh, you know, the one you want, and then you can insert a trim. You can also insert colors. Um, you can insert a stop. So there's a lot of things you can do with the, the editing of the software uh, with a stock design. It's not just open a stock design, add stock lettering, and that's all you could do. There's, there's extra stuff you can do in there, and I'm glad I was able to help you with that. Um, Naomi, really with the DSG, it's a little, uh, you can't actually do the uh, stitch editing as you can with a um, DST format, because basically with a DST, it's each individual stitch. So it's easy to select one particular stitch and do it that way. Um, up in here, let me just close this window down a little bit so I can scroll up and we can get to our text. Um, let's see, I'll, I'll use the letter L for example. So we'll choose our editing stitch here. And this is a stock, this is a DSG file that I created. Left click and now I'm on the individual stitch. So I want to break this up, have it two colors. I want to choose right here. I want to say stop the color. Insert a trim. So now I have this section here and that section there. I have two different sections in my Word Publix. And that's simply the same way I did it with the stock design. You can do it with your text. So, you know, just zoom into what the particular part you're doing. Oh, let me, did I miss it? Where is the word Publix? There it is. And I can just change the color. So now I've got the word Publix in two separate colors because I went in and actually selected a particular stitch went to insert and inserted a trim. So yes, you can, Naomi. Uh, needles to say digitizing over under patterns is challenging. It is, it's, it's um, you know, you just gotta practice. You think of it when you're digitizing that you're starting from the background, working your way on top. So things in the background will um, be overlaid or overlap inside of the other sections because when you put the other sections on top, that is what actually defines between the two colors um, of a design. You know, for example, I'm looking at this uh, logo right here. You know, when doing it, I would do the red background first, and when placing it down, I would actually overlap inside the orange color, because when I come down with the orange color, that's what's going to define the line between the two colors. So always work from the back to the front and overlap when you can. Uh, see, James wants to know, how would you do text on the back of a cap? Um, one thing, James, is I would definitely um, hoop the cap in flat mode. And um, oh, the, best way to, to do, uh, the best way to do a cap is, um, you know, find the corner of a table, place your hoop on the, right there on the corner, lay your backing down, and then your hat obviously is going to be upside down in your hands. Place it just over the corner, and then place your top hoop on top of it, to be able to um, hoop just the back of the cap. Now, if the, if the, if the snapback has the arch where it's open in the back, um, or even when if it's straight across, like a flex fit um, cap, you don't, 
you're not going to hoop the whole hat. You're going to have a little bit of a gap at the top of that hoop so that you've got enough room to be able to sew on the back of the cap. So I would definitely um, hoop it with a flat mode, probably with a 90 or 120 uh, round hoop, depending on the size of your design. And then when you put it on the machine, you do have to remember, make sure that you rotate your design 180 degrees because your cap is upside down on it and it's still in flat mode. So load your design and then rotate it 180 degrees. Um, I think we have a, a YouTube video of how to hoop the back of caps that way on our YouTube channel. Um, so if you, just, if you just search for the YouTube um, uh, Cole Desi, uh, you should be able to find that video. If not, we can definitely get it to you. Uh, let's see. Pat wants to know, how far can you increase a DST file that you purchased roughly three inches to five inches or six inches? Um, it, you don't want to increase a stock design or a DST file you purchased too much because what happens is it starts to lose it's for its formality so it starts getting distorted when you go too big so I would go anywhere from maybe 10 to 20 percent um, would be safe before it starts distorting the design um, some designs depends on the way it was digitized you might be able to go a little bit more or a little bit less uh, shrinking it down but as a rule of thumb Pat I would go maybe 10 to 20 percent change because you'll have some satin stitches that will get too big, so not only to be fill stitches, and there's no way to actually convert a satin stitch to a fill stitch with the software. So you have to look at it that way, or a running stitch to do detail. Now is big enough, it should have been a satin stitch, or vice versa, a fill stitch you shrunk down is now too small for a fill and should be a satin stitch. So um, rule of thumb, I would go roughly 10 to 20% uh, when sizing a, a uh, DST design. Um, not a problem. I'll um, I'll make sure um, I'll get to Mark and have him. Uh, you know, when he sends out this video that we're creating today to you guys, I'll also have him send out the video on how to hoop the back of caps so that you have that as well. Um. Yes, downward is the same, Pat. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, you got to design three inches. You want to take it to one and a half. I might go maybe ten percent. Um, a larger design, five inch design, you can take down to a three inch. You know, ten to twenty percent would be good that way. Um, but yeah, you definitely when you do that, you definitely want to look at the stitching on how far you're you're decreasing it to make sure it's not distorting it.